Well, I'm Jeff Rowley, uh, County's Risk Manager, and this is Cheryl Ivey, Sterling County uh, Volunteer Coordinator. She has a much bigger job than I do. Uh, we're glad to be here, glad to have you all in our county. Uh, as, I guess the only county excluded really from, from the group anyway, but uh, we're glad to be here at the chapter for today and take the last few minutes of your day. Uh, I was listening to the Senator Ford reminded me of a funny story I read in the business press just recently about uh, drug testing. And there was a bus driver who had, was called up for a random drug test. And uh, after he got back, uh, his bosses called him into the, bo into the office and said, oh, come on, was that your blood test? Was that your blood that you, you gave? And uh, he said, yeah, it's mine. And, he, and the boss said, well, congratulations on being pregnant. <laughs> Apparently, it submitted uh, uh, something not of its own. But, uh, so anyway, things like that happen. Um, we in Salt Lake County have a lot of volunteers, and Cheryl's going to talk about that. And I'm I'm uh, glad to be here speaking with Cheryl today. Uh, I have had a big job, and after work, I go and I work with Boy Scouts a lot, and that's like herding cats. But what Cheryl does is like herding cats, lots of cats, and make sure every one of them feels like they rule the house. And then they can, uh, you know, they can So, uh, with that, I'll turn the over to Cheryl to get started. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I want to thank Jeff for inviting me also to be here today. I told Jeff I'm not, um, I'm not a public speaker that follows the rules very well. So, if I'm here or there, uh, Jeff has made copious notes for me, which I really appreciate, and, and tried to kind of keep me in line with things, but um, I don't always stay there. So. Let me tell you a little bit about Salt Lake County Volunteer Services. Um, we have about 70 different volunteer programs in Salt Lake County. Um, and those are most, mostly social service programs. So obviously Meals on Wheels, um, RSVP, which is for senior, senior transportation, food service programs, aging programs. One of the handouts that you have there, and, and I apologize for not having the 2014, but we literally just finished compiling all of that information. It was our report that we do every year. Um, with all of our volunteer programs. So you can look at that, and all of those in goal are various volunteer programs that we have at the county. So we have a ton of volunteer programs. Um, we are down a little bit in our volunteer numbers this year, which follows a national trend, but, uh, and what I just compiled, and again, I just completed it, about over, almost for 24,000 volunteers for this year. 24,000 volunteers, uh, primarily in the programs, but also in special events and special projects. They have contributed about 700,000 hours uh, to our volunteer program, which is amazing. And as a result of that, it saves the county just from volunteer man hours about $16 million a year. So obviously, if we did not have these volunteers, we would not be able to do the social programs that we do, let alone, again, the, the special events. Um, we, that 17 million, by the way, Jeff asked where that number came from, and I, I go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I do have to kind of play a little bit with the number in the last quarter, because they don't actually come out with that until the well into the year. That they just now gave me about two weeks ago, third quarter of 2014. So I take an average of the fourth quarter of comparing the third quarter to the fourth quarter of the last 10 years and what percentage of growth, and I manipulate that a little bit to get myself to the fourth quarter for this year. Um, for this year, it was 20, let's say last year it was $22.58. This year, that went up to, oh, I know I've got that in here somewhere, $23.10. So if you ever wanted to, to, and that is for Salt Lake County, by the way. Um, you and other counties, smaller counties, may find that to be a little bit different, a little bit different wage number. But in Salt Lake County, that is the average hourly wage for an employee not within Salt Lake County government, but within Salt Lake County. And that's obviously considered <coughs> doctors and farmers. I know, none of us, we're all looking at that. We're in government, so we know we don't make that much for the most part. But remember that we have doctors that help us, you know, with aging services and youth services. And we have professionals, we have attorneys, we have engineers. Um, we have, so we have to assume that our value of our employee or of our volunteer is somewhat equivalent to those <coughs> that, you know, again, run the gamut of all employment in Salt Lake County. Um, along with, the, Salt Lake County actually, Volunteer Services is in charge of a few different things. One is, of course, uh, looking over our 70 programs and working with our 70 or so volunteer coordinators. Uh, we also do special events. 
And I just want to, while I'm there, I may as well talk about it just a moment. Um, one, for instance, we have coming up, and you've got a small flyer where it says volunteer. And you all may want to look at this if you're not already in the future with Comcast. Comcast Cares Day is an event that you may also, this year is obviously, while the event has not yet happened, we've already compiled all the list of projects we're going to do. But we've committed a thousand volunteers at Salt Lake County for Comcast Cares Day. It's a pretty cool event, and I'm not going to tell you that very many events do this, where you're working with an outside vendor that's going to offer you this, but not only do they help you in some of your service areas that you need, we have people showing up at animal services, youth services, three of our senior services, and two park cleanups, so we have seven projects for this. They actually bring a monetary donation to each volunteer that signs up to that particular program. So we're going to partner with them this year. It's the first time we have partnered with them. We've partnered with other corporations and businesses before. Uh, generally, they don't bring this kind of dollar amount to us, but it can come into the tens of thousands of dollars if you get enough volunteers out there. So it's something when you look at special events, you may want to do at some point. Um, let's see, what did I say? Special events, our 70 volunteer service programs, emergency services. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we move on, because um, I want to go over some of the, the things that, that regard to help keep um, your volunteers safe. And I know the gentleman before us talked about that, but we'll, we'll talk about that as well as what we do with emergency services. Emergency services in Salt Lake County is relatively new. Um, while it has somewhat been on the books that volunteer services will, will work in an emergency capacity with volunteers, it wasn't until the 2011 floods that we really put that into play. Uh, Salt Lake County was highly threatened with flooding in 2011. If you remember, that was the year we had heavy, heavy snowpack, um, a very shortened period of melt-off. Um, we had a very cool spring, and we went from what would normally be about a seven-week period of melting to down into about 12 days. So we had an enormous amount of runoff. We were able to um, mobilize 1,400 volunteers within about two weeks' time to start with sandbagging. And it was, uh, it was really an incredible event. When gentleman before talked about his biggest fear, that what, what you go to bed worried about at night, mine wasn't the safety issue as much as whether or not anybody would show up. And when we put out a call for volunteers, um, I didn't know if five volunteers would show up, and we had our goal each and every Saturday and some evenings were to do 5,000 sandbags. And we can't do that with five volunteers. And the first day that we did that, um, we opened the gates and cars just started pouring in, cars and vans and trucks. And let me tell you, the first 30 minutes, I couldn't work with anybody because I was crying <laughs> because it was so overwhelming. But we did that primarily help from the media and we captured every single name of every single individual that called us on the phone because they heard about it, saw, or just knew that they were in trouble or their neighbor was in trouble. We got all of their names, we got all of their emails, we asked permission to be able to call them out, and we started building the database. And by about the second week that we had done that, we had 1,400 names of individuals that we could email and start bringing in every single weekend. So we did that for about five weeks running. Um, and a couple of nights as well to come in and volunteer. Uh, again, I'll go over after Jeff talks a little bit about some of the ways that we try to keep them safe and some of the ways that we've organized them. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about the workers' comp and as far as how we treat our volunteers because that's very important too. Um, I think actually at this time I am going to turn it over to Jeff. Let him talk a little bit about all the safety issues and Jeff works with the DA's office, he's our risk manager, and uh, he knows everything there is to know about what we're doing and we care of our volunteers and I'll come back in and then we'll vote back in. No, that's for sure. Um, I, I apologize to Cheryl. I meant before we started to ask you all who are you enough to talk. So what's your function in your organization so that we can kind of get her this place? I see I know there's volunteer coordinators here. What else? Risk managers. Risk managers? Okay. Fair directors. Fair directors. Okay. And in your position as fair directors, is it just the one annual fair or are there like lots of little events that go on? Both. Both. Both? Okay. Very good, thank you. Uh, so, as you can see, we get a lot of volunteers in Salt Lake County. I, I didn't quite hear Cheryl say this, 
but uh, the number of hours we get out of our volunteers equals 337 employees, uh, FTEs. Uh, and so that's, you know, that figures into that value of these people. And uh, from a risk management perspective, over the years I have learned that the trade-off versus the cost of these volunteers and the risk is huge. Uh, volunteers are great, and, and in our experience, we rarely have issues with them uh, of any sort. They just come, they work, and then they go uh, away happier and feeling more community-oriented. So uh, that's why we make such a big emphasis on it. We've got a high-powered person like Cheryl running the program. Uh, but volunteers for government are different than for any other kind of organization. How many of you put together events that are public-private partnerships? No, not necessarily like the uh, Comcast Care Center. Um, how many of you put together programs where it's county and city all working together? Uh, well, that creates a scenario that uh, is, can be its own problem because of documentation of where these volunteers come from. Whose volunteers are they? Uh, but that's even more so when you're talking about a volunteer who, who is recruited by a private group. Uh, it could be the Boy Scouts. It could be a corporate sponsor. Whoever they are, you have to kind of know whose volunteer is whose. Uh, outside of government, volunteers are really not under the law owed any kind of benefit. If they are hurt, injured, anything like that, they're not owed anything. But you as an organizer of an event should probably, uh, and this has probably already been talked about in your certificates of insurance, you should get insurance from them. Most of them will have insurance policies that provide some protection for volunteers under a bodily injury coverage of maybe $3,000 or $10,000. That's their method for taking care of their people, and it kind of, you know, get, takes care of the initial medicals and kind of you know, sends them on their way. Under government uh, and under state law, because volunteering is such a big part of life here in Utah, uh, there are some very specific requirements for who's a volunteer and what are the benefits owed to a volunteer. Uh, and all of that comes out of the Volunteer uh, Government Workers Act, which is under the Utah Code, Section 67-20. Uh, and they identify four different kinds of volunteers. And uh, you probably uh, actually would use three out of four of these kinds of volunteers. The first one is a general volunteer. It's just a volunteer that comes to do all kinds of services no, without any specific requirements, uh, background, anything like that. And that would be what you have generally at a fair or event. The other kind is a compensatory service worker. These would be individuals who, as a part of their role, uh, their sentencing, their plea deals, uh, have to do community service. How many of you use those in your events? Um, now, there are certainly some positions in your events you wouldn't want them to have, <laughs> right? <laughs> but on the other hand, if you can have these people helping with the setup, if you can have them doing the cleanup, that sort of a thing, um, perfect and cheap, right? Compensatory service workers. And there's a very specific set of requirements for them and benefits to them. The, the third type is a volunteer safety officer, and under the law that's called, volunteer safety officer is either somebody who is acting in a position and has specific authority as a volunteer for police work, so they have some police powers as a volunteer. How many of you in your counties have a volunteer uh, police force? Okay, uh, a few. The other side of that is volunteer firefighters. How many of you have volunteer firefighters in your counties? And you would use those, you know, standby for fires, but also, of course, uh, in your event emergency shop where you've got paramedics in there. Uh, so, and then there's a, the final group, just in case you want to know, the volunteer search and rescue team members. These are individuals from the community specifically identified on a sheriff's uh, list of volunteer search and rescue officers. So let's take the example of some child is lost in the forest, and they call out and ask for volunteers. Not every volunteer that shows up will be a volunteer search and rescue officer. These are individuals who are already on a list, they have specific skills and training, uh, but they're just not employed uh, by your county. So who knows, you might have a volunteer search and rescue event that you have to help coordinate. Uh, but generally we'll focus on these, these other types. Uh, now, um, volunteers, I understand, I heard earlier that you've already talked about volunteers having to be designated previous speaker called it a designated volunteer list. Under state law, uh, any volunteer for any program 
Uh, even any event has to be designated by and accepted by the executive uh, officer and your personnel office. But let me just ask you, just for curiosity's sake, how many of your counties actually run every volunteer through both of those levels of government? Yeah. Can we admit something? To you? <laughs> With that many volunteers that we have, and many one-day event volunteers, we don't do that. So uh, out these departments have designated ways to do it and people to authorize them. But I don't say that um, to diminish the value of knowing exactly who your volunteers are. Let's say you have an event coordinated by the county and one or two cities. And everything's going great, but somebody gets injured. Uh, they might say, well, you know, I, I was there because I know a friend at the county, and so I was there them if they're not on your list you're not necessarily responsible for them uh, what if you don't know who brought them there uh, you know you, you don't want to have a tussle between the public entities to figure out who's responsible for that person and if they're not on anybody's list there may still be some things you might want to do but you're not committed to the lifelong investment that you are for the rest of the volunteers let me just talk about that investment for a minute uh, under the volunteer act uh, volunteers are considered government employees, not for uh, you know, merit positions and all that kind of, those kinds of benefits, but certainly for workers' compensation. But workers' compensation for most of your volunteers is limited to what? Medical. Medical only. Now, the law changed in Utah in 2011. If you owe medical benefits, how long do you owe those benefits for? Life. So, <coughs> fortunately, most volunteers don't get injured to the point where uh, you have to you know, manage that for the entire life of the person. It doesn't matter how old they are, if they have an injury uh, on, and while working for you as a volunteer, you owe it to them for life. Uh, one example we had that was kind of unfortunate was a lady volunteer who was a horse rider riding with the regala and her horse was all decked out uh, representing our sheriff in a parade. And uh, while she was getting ready to go, uh, one horse bit the other horse's butt, and she got thrown off and broke her back. Uh, and so we are monitoring that claim for the rest of her life. Uh, there's another part of workers' comp that applies for most everybody else, for all the employees, and that is the indemnity side. Under workers' compensation, you're entitled to, of course, lost wages. You're entitled to death benefits. You're entitled to Benefits, if you end up with some kind of a disability, let's say you're, you injure your arm and when the doctors are all done with you, you can't straighten it out or you'll never have quite the strength you used to have. There's a, a benefit for that, a one-time payout. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you're permanently totally disabled, there's a <coughs> So, But volunteers don't get those benefits. Uh, and so it's just the medical side. So you take care of that. But this poor lady had a career and then she had a broken back. And uh, being the cowgirl that she was, she cowboyed up and uh, she got better pretty fast. And, and uh, we still pay once in a while for things uh, on her behalf, but um, it could have been a lot worse. You can imagine with a broken back. One thing to emphasize there, even for our employees that get uh, full workers' compensation benefits, if they're severely injured or they die, it's just not worth it. Workers' comp doesn't pay enough to make that worth it. For a volunteer, absolutely not. Somebody from the community. So what that means is you have to step back on the risk management side, and of course you as event managers, volunteer coordinators, you wear that risk management hat just as much as I do. And I just put something on. Cheryl, is my time wrong? <laughs> <laughs> it's my subtle way of telling you that. I apologize. <laughs> I wasn't over there. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's your, your role to make sure that wherever you put your volunteers, it's a safe environment. That's not easy when you're talking about emergency situations. And by the way, a while ago, Cheryl was talking about floods from snowpack. Just if you can't remember, that's that stuff that's on the hill there. We haven't seen it for a few years, but there is a little bit out there. Uh, but you know, you put your volunteers out there putting sandbags. You need to have specific requirements that they should not be on the other side, that they should not approach the stream, uh, you know, what's the distance. There should be a safety officer monitoring them, safety officer preferably an employee making sure that they are not approaching danger. 
uh, keep them away or keep them busy. Because um, it's just not worth it. You don't want your volunteers to get injured, uh, especially not injured badly or killed. So that's the workers' comp benefit. The other side of that, though, is if you use volunteer police officers, volunteer firefighters, the law is a little bit different. They are actually qualified to receive uh, all the indemnity benefits. And the indemnity benefit, since they're a volunteer, the state said, well, we have to figure out how much we pay them. And it is actually the maximum amount uh, allowed by law under workers' compensation. So some of us might actually make less than they do <laughs> under workers' compensation. But, but uh, so that's an added benefit to them because uh, of the nature of those positions, police and fire, they're kind of a hazardous position. Um, okay, second thing that is specific to volunteers is that they are qualified, they receive these benefits and are qualified for the operation of a motor vehicle or any other uh, motorized equipment if they are licensed to use those. And so you can have your volunteers drive your vehicles. Uh, we would certainly recommend that you have those volunteers qualified in the same way that you qualify your employees. Uh, and that you have put them on your designated list. So you don't end up with a situation like South Salt Lake had just a few years ago, where a vagrant man approached a couple of officers that stopped at a D's restaurant. Uh, he asked them for money. They declined to give him any money, but being police officers, for some reason, they left their vehicle running because you never know when you have to escape fast and you don't have two seconds to turn your car on or unlock it, for that matter. Anyway, this vagrant guy got in the car, went for a joyride, and the police officers were running until he crashed it, uh, and uh, now it's also makes him a big deal. So you want to qualify your volunteers uh, by state law. You have to. You have to make sure they have a license, but it's certainly a good idea to make sure that they meet the same standards that your employees do. And there will be volunteers that are qualified to drive your big front-end loaders, uh, but just pre-qualify them. Uh, and lastly, um, your volunteers apply or qualify for the same protections that we do. Uh, let me just read this. Uh, Section 63G-7-202 uh, says, Protections come from action brought for an injury caused by an act or omission that occurs during the performance of an employee's duties within the scope of employment or under color authority. This means that you have to know what the scope of employment is for these people. So they are qualified for all full liability protection, defense, and indemnification, just like we are as employees. Uh, but in order for you to say, yes, we, we will provide that for you if an accident were to happen, or no, we're not, you have to know what your position is. And so designating a particular assignment for volunteers in advance is a very important part of any volunteer program. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Cheryl and talk about how we do that in some other Okay. So um, I think I want to, a couple things. One, and I, I didn't hand these out as, as um, or didn't copy these as handouts, but um, you'll notice on the bottom of our volunteer um, report that we do is our website. And I encourage you, if you have any interest whatsoever, to go to the website and you'll see forms there. And you can, you can actually see some of the forms that we have that we require from our volunteers. One of the first things that, that we do, um, on, obviously, is, is get an application. We want to know who they are. Uh, and again, special events, not as much, but I'm going to talk just general volunteers right now for programs. And certainly, if you have special event volunteers that are continual volunteers, show up for all of your events all the time, you want to know who they are. So we have a, uh, an application process. They go online, and actually, that one comes straight into me. Um, I, in turn, then turn around and blast that out to all my volunteer coordinators, and we usually try to find a place for them. But that is one of the documents that, that we start with. Um, once we get a volunteer in our front door, one of the other things that we want to do is make sure that they understand they are held to the same standards as any one of our employees, and that is they read the sexual harassment form. And they read that form and understand that you know, they're not going to be pinching anyone on the back end, they're not going to harass anybody. They're held to the exact same standards as an employee who is held to those standards. Along with that is a contract, and that contract is something they sign that basically says two things. Yes, I've read that sexual harassment claim. I know that I, I cannot do that, and if I do so, I will be removed. And secondly, it tells them that they are covered by our workman's comp, or worker's comp, I should say. So we cover all of our volunteers with worker's comp. Do all of you do that? Yeah. 
Do you? Okay, because I know that a lot of municipalities, and, and Jeff had, had mentioned working in coordination with other municipalities or private partnerships. A lot of municipalities do not, and as he mentioned, that, that sometimes causes a bit um, of concern for us because we understand that if that's the case, and Harriman, or not Harriman, because that's in Salt Lake County, we work a lot, we do a monitor <coughs> exercise every year, an yeah, emergency exercise, and we can have some people from Utah County. And when we do that, they do not have, some municipalities do not have that sort of coverage, and so it becomes a, a concern then is who's going to cover them when they do that. But by signing that contract, again, we're letting them know that they are covered by workers' comp, and that they have read and understand the sexual harassment form. That's a, another form, and you'll find that on there. Um, you'll find our sexual harassment, and you'll find our workers' comp. Um, another thing that you're gonna find on there is, um, The, a form that we distribute, and you all probably have some sort of, or a similar sort of form like that, I think that happened in here, and I believe you have it in your packet, and that's the form that basically we put at every site, I don't know where the heck it it's a form, it's a dual, there you go, it's this, it looks too many wrong for us here, it's this one, then, and this one we've done on two, so that we can do, and save money and print two up, and cut them in half, but we have this form that basically tells people when they show up that they are covered by workers' comp. And when they sign in, we not only have them in this sort of format, literally on the table for them to take with them, if they want a reminder of that, we also tape it to the top of the table, the check-in table, and we also post it on walls, you know, anything where we can post it so that they understand that they are covered by workers' comp. Sure. Um, can I just mention a great benefit of that is that you also find out immediately if they get injured while they're volunteering for it. If they don't know that they're, they've got some medical coverage, they might run off and do their own thing, get their own medical care through their own doctors. And uh, the problem with that on my side is that means that it's totally out of my control. I can't put them into a network of great doctors and facilities that I have a contract with to reduce the price. They can go ahead and have surgeries and all these kinds of things. And then, then you find out about it after the fact and you're swimming upstream to, to figure out what's related and what is not a control. Yeah, there is all, sometimes one downside. I think we've only had one in all the sandbagging and flooding exercises we did. We had one injury and it was it was a gentleman that came to us and when he said, where do I go? You know, we were right at the front to tell people where to go to help with sandbagging and we said right over there. And he said, he, he actually asked, you know, why, why should I be doing this? Why should I be here? Although he had driven to be there. And we said, be well, because you're going to help your community. You're going to be filling sandbags. It's going to keep somebody's home or business from flooding. And how much we appreciate you being here. And um, he said, what if I get injured? And we said, immediately, well, well you're covered by our workers' comp. And his eyes lit up. <laughs> and he walked away and Jeff Gravett, who's the head of emergency services, and I looked at each other and said, there's our first claim. Mm -hmm. And he did. <laughs> literally, he was there not an hour. Literally, I, I, I don't think he was there 30 minutes. And he came back and said, I hurt my back. And he was gone. And I know we heard from him and you'd heard from him and that was in 2011 and I have no idea if we're still caring for his back or not, but I'm pretty sure that we probably did the surgery on that. People like that generally don't know that we look at their past medical work. <laughs> and that may have, may have been the case and I'm not quite sure how it turned out. I know I just turned it over to Jeff, but there is a downside to that. Um, but it is, it's one of the things that we want to make certain that they do understand that they are covered. Um, Jeff, you didn't mention that, and I know that I use this, and I and I may or may not. We we actually save money too um, by covering people with workers' comp at the county, and, and you probably do as well because when you have as big a work pool as we do, and we have over four thousand full-time employees and a couple other thousand seasonal and part-time employees. When you start looking at how many injuries they are, and then all of a sudden you add in twenty-four thousand volunteers, your percentage of claims gets really, really low. Mm -hmm. And when it's that low, you're going to get a better rate. And by doing that, we actually end up, I, I can't imagine that we, I, in all, in the, since I took over volunteer services, I've only seen that I know of one claim come through, and that was that gentleman's, whether or not it was. I, we very seldom ever had a claim from anybody who is a volunteer. I'm sure there are a few others out there, but again, the savings far usually outweighs the cost of what's going to be to cover your volunteers. So. 
So the last, the last thing that you're going to see on our website is going to be a disclosure statement. It doesn't, it's not applicable so much at, with our boards. We have volunteer boards as well. It's a little bit more applicable with them. Um, if in fact someone wants to get on a board because they have something they want to sell the county. Let's say they want to be on our parks and rec board and they happen to, they and their brother own a company that sells soccer balls. Um, so we have them tell us that in advance. We just want to know. You know, that doesn't maybe mean that they can't sit on that board, but we want to know in advance and we want to make certain that they're aware that they've signed a disclosure form or a disclosure form that they let us know that there may be a conflict of interest of some kind. So, um, you guys mostly deal with one-time events, right? Special fairs and, and one-time events. So, I want to tell a few things that it may or may not be applicable for what you do, but it has worked for us. Um, again, one of the things, if you're working with volunteers, we're going to have that earthquake roll out of here one of these days, folks. And if you don't have already the fires, and you don't have the mudslides, and you don't have the flooding, and all of those things that can happen, in your community. If nothing else, one day, I know you're all preparing for shakeout, and we are too. One of these days, we're going to have that earthquake. Now, our volunteers are handled by our regular volunteer service program, our emergency volunteers. But if you haven't started to capture those names, and somehow or other figure that those volunteers are also going to be the first line that you're going to contact when you have a special, or you have an emergency, start doing it now. Besides the online application for volunteers, we printed out an emergency volunteer application. And I think I, I turned in this copy to you because it's something we came out with this past year. We wanted to make sure, last year, we wanted to make sure that we were getting these folks. We asked them what sort of things they want to be called for, what sort of emergency impacts they want to be called for, and then maybe what sort of training they may have as well. And these are, you know, as your volunteers are checking into things, just say, hey, have you thought about whether or not you'd like to volunteer in case we have an emergency? It is amazing how many of those people do want to, and they are compelled to volunteer. Sometimes I can't get them out for anything else, but all I have to do is pick up the phone and say, we're going to have a sandbag exercise, which we've had the last two years. I don't think we'll even go there this year. Uh, I don't think that's going to be an issue whatsoever. But those are the first people that show up. Sure. Oh, I imagine that plays well with your the county circuit programs. Well, and that's, I'm going to talk about oh, that because we do, we down. have the, the community, um, and I'm sure you all have CERT programs, the Community Emergency Response Team. I'm CERT trained myself. That's how I um, actually was introduced to it before I was even uh, in volunteer management um, when I was in the mayor's office. So one of the things that we have done as a result of the CERT training and emergency services has started to, when we have one of these events, we put into place our ICS, our incident command system sort of control. And it works really, really well. And you can go online and find this, and it's free to take these courses, by the way, online. But it works really well when you have these special events. You know, incident command span of control is seven people. Well, if you have one CERT person or what, and by the way, CERT people are fabulous to have as your volunteers. They're wonderful because they understand ICS, they understand incident control, and they understand how to manage volunteers. It's not to say something if we don't have a good amigo, because you occasionally do. So you might have to work around that. But um, some of the documents that I passed out, and these are just specific to, for us, it was specific to sandbagging. But they were the way that we went about setting these up to make certain that we had a safe a production line as possible. And the first thing we did, of course, was a little media. And you know, we sent out a media report saying this is what we need, that reminder of what all to bring that for the under purpose pins, um, clipboards, volunteer, I think I wrote pins twice, so obviously they're very important. Um, volunteer service banners, notepads, those things were for myself. But, you know, develop yourself a little, make sure that when you get something out, you get your media out and they know exactly what you're looking for. Cheryl, I think we're down to just a few minutes. Oh, okay. I'm going to move on very quickly then, because um, I know that you have some up. Volunteer check-in, again, this is the best way for you to, to gather your volunteers. Make sure that you have them for emergency. If they're going to be covered, you know this by workers' comp, you have to check them in, you have to check them out. You have to know when they check in and when they check out. So make certain that you do that. And then um, lastly, and again, this is your RCS and incident command. Make sure that you that you have some sort of flowchart as to how this is going to work. 
need to know how you're going to volunteer or how you're going to manage volunteers, who to put in charge, who's going to be doing what that day, and set yourself up a graph and have names and have them understand what they're going to be doing. Go back to Jeff and then we'll do Okay. Um, but Cheryl, let me ask you a quick question. Yes. What is the difference between our process for recognizing volunteers for a long-term program versus a specific event? Okay. Uh, long-term volunteers, and, and we have various ways of doing it. We have the pins and all of those. All of you know, though, that budgets have become limited over the last six or seven years. We no longer have the Shoskis, the gifts, the playthings that we used to do. We have found, actually, though, that the best way to honor a long-term volunteer is literally, we, we do a proclamation, we bring in the mayor, we put it on the council agenda, they get a little proclamation, it's read by the mayor, everybody applies, they get to say a few words, they walk out with something framed, and they generally appreciate that more than a clock. Um, that sort of recognition. So for a long-term volunteer, we do that. Uh, when it's a short-term volunteer, it is, it's just questions, questions, questions. Are you happy? Where do you want to be? Are you doing what you want to be doing? And then thank you, thank you, thank you. And we send out thank yous afterwards for everybody's email we've captured. You know, we thank them profusely while they're volunteering. We make sure we have people walking around giving them water. We usually try to, if not, get some uh, third vendor to come in and, and provide us pizza or subways or something. We'll try to feed them. You know, we have donuts for them. We have a safety manager. And just, again, mainly thanking them over and over and over. And the amazing thing with volunteers, you know, most of the time they're thanking you for letting them be there, which is remarkable. So. I just have two quick things. Uh, we've described the landscape for, for volunteers, uh, but th that landscape may be changing. The case that came out last year, um, a case called Mallory, uh, where uh, BYU had, uh, Provo City authorized BYU to have people doing traffic control, and the Supreme Court, if somebody was injured because of bad traffic control, um, the Supreme Court said, well, those were agents of the city because they were directing traffic under the direction of, of the city, and so they were agents of them. We don't know exactly where that will go, or even if, if that will go any further, we hope not. But also, uh, you might remember in 2013, there were 19 firefighters killed at a wildland fire called the Yarnell Fire. Uh, Twelve of those uh, firefighters' families sued because they were volunteer firefighters. And the rest of the firefighters got all of these other benefits uh, from working for them, but they got essentially nothing because there was no medical uh, applied to these people. They were just dead on the hillside. And so that's creating some fervor uh, in a neighboring state, and that might carry over uh, in Utah, too. So the landscape might be changing a little bit. Uh, so let's open it up for any questions you might have. Do you do job descriptions for your volunteers? We do. Well, um, not for when we do a lot of our no, ad hoc no. special events, um, although we do try, give them assignments. Uh, but certainly, yes, every one of our programs has a job description. And for that matter, BCF or BCI checks, we talked about that. Um, uh, if we're working on a vulnerable society, you know, the elderly, young, um, uh, any of those, we're definitely going to do a BCI check. Um, library even does that. But yes, we do have all, and we have expectations. And just, I'm sure you know this, you, you can fire volunteers. Um, but I call volunteering, I, I equate it all the time to speed dating, because um, we have so many programs, and not every volunteer project or service program is perfect for that volunteer, and they don't know that coming in. So the main, our job is to make certain, again, this is the questions, 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 is to make certain that they're happy doing that. The worst thing for me is to have a volunteer go to youth services and find out they just can't handle that. I know I can't handle, I love our animal services. I can't do it. I would own every cat and every dog they had. So I can't do it, and I love those people that can. But if it's not for you, um, we are there to make certain that we're going to find a volunteer opportunity that is perfect for you. So the, just remember, it's like speed dating. And I always tell my volunteers that just please don't give up if one doesn't work for you. Please understand that we've got 69 other programs, and one of those is going to be the absolute perfect fit for you. So yes, we do a job. How do you actually tell a volunteer? 
Didn't show up. Yeah. <laughs> and it is technical. Um, you know, it, and it's very, very difficult. And, 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 I mean, there, there is an occasion of those that we, it just comes down to we cannot use you. But generally, we will try to find them something else that just, and move them to that saying, you know what? I cannot believe that you have done what you have done in the position you have, but I so need you over here. Okay, would you consider changing? And usually the ego always wins out. You know, I, your, your qualifications and attributes are exactly what I need in this position. Doesn't always work out. Um, I know, you've got someone in particular in mind, I know. Uh, and we have some of those too that we've literally just had to fire. But usually we, we're pretty adept at moving them from, from one program to another. And we have such a diversity of programs, it's easier for us, but I'm sure it is for some of you. The other thing too is just making certain that you have the right job for them. Sometimes it's a matter of what job it is. Um, I worked on campaigns, and I had a volunteer that one time she called up uh, constituent and said, who are you going to vote for? And they said the other candidate's name. And she said, what the hell are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously took her off the phones. <laughs> they took her off the phones. So, so, but you have those. And she, and she, we found her something and she was very happy doing that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a balancing act. And, but again, the, the main thing with volunteers, as you know, is it, they're there. They're not there to be thanked for the most time, but it goes a long, long way from so doing that constantly, constantly to fortifying how great we are to be there. Other questions? Do you have a database that you store all of the emergency volunteers so you could just say we need CDL and then it'll just pull up? Emergency, um, I do. Emergency, we set up literally just an Excel spreadsheet. It's not a database. I wish they had a great emergency database out there or a program that we could afford to buy. You just an Excel spreadsheet. But we just do an Excel, an Excel spreadsheet. Initially, what we did literally, it was, so, it was so down and dirty that I had email lists and then I realized, oh my goodness, if I have more than one site, I don't want to send the same email out to everybody and have them all show up at one site. So I started doing them and dividing them alphabetically, A through D, E through G, E through, and then so that I had five different lists and it was just by alphabet. Um, so I could send one list and say, would you go to Mill Creek? And another one say, would you go to Public Works? It was just as down and dirty as that. Um, I'm gonna give one last, I know we're running out of time, but how many of you have problem checking people in and checking people out when it's volunteers and you've got a ton of them? Do any of you have that? We found this little nifty, and again, you may have a better program, but this has worked for us when it came to floods. Most people come in kind of sporadically, and it's pretty easy to sign them up. We've got a table set up, we've got four people sitting there, and they're signing up on clipboards, and they're writing their name and their emails <coughs> and when they came in. But it's when they leave, it's a nightmare, because they all leave at once. So we started doing something that was really kind of cool. We, we printed out five different colors of paper on clipboards. So we had a clipboard with blue, and one with pink, and one with green, and one with orange. And then we went out and bought corresponding dots that you could just get it at um, Office Max. And, when, so, and then we numbered the pages. And if they came in and they signed in on a blue page, on the first page, and the page was numbered one, they got a blue dot with a number one. And they knew exactly what list to go to and sign up. They looked through 20 names instead of literally times when we had 400 people show up for Sam Becky. And it has been such a great little, who would have thought? It's so simple, so rudimentary, but it has been such a great little process. Again, checking in, not an issue, but checking out. And you've got to get them to check out or that worker's comp is, you need to know they're all checked out. Any other questions? about the job? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you.